Hey everybody, it's the Bear Facts with your favorite bear, T-Bear. And my honored guest is Bent Montench today. It's good to see you, Ben. We're, we're, I am honored. I'm honored yeah. to see your face. I've had the fortune to, to meet you when I started recording my album a few years ago. And uh, it was uh, over at uh, Robbie Krieger's studio. Uh, Horse Latitudes yeah. uh, with uh, Tony Bronigal and uh, Michael Dumas, and that was really a lot of fun. And uh, I, I yeah, really, I really enjoyed your your uh, your counsel actually. And you were kind of giving me some interesting ideas and things. For example, I hope they were good. Yeah, yeah, they really were. For example. <clears throat> And I'll get into we'll get into like the the the, the nuts and bolts of this conversation. But um, we were talking about I had seen a tango documentary, and you turned to me and said, "Yeah, I tried tango and almost broke my ankle." <laughs> I, I think <laughs> I had a I had a really terrible dancing accident. <laughs> tango i don't know i don't think it was that it was a an attempt at swing dancing with a friend of mine i took dance lessons at arthur murray right partly largely because i wanted to know how it worked because i'm just fascinated watching fred and ginger and partly to impress some girl who you know was unimpressed <laughs> but <laughs> yeah tango is an interesting dance it, doesn't, it didn't make any sense to me at all but i thought it was beautiful yeah but, but I did, I broke, I tore, I tore both menisci on my right knee to hell and back and was like laid up for a long time with the surgery, dancing possibly the tango or something. What yeah. advice did I give you? Was it don't dance the tango with the back of Largo? <laughs> no, your advice was write a tango song, <laughs> which I ended up writing um, and, and we recorded. Uh, that was a lot of fun. So, folks, let's talk about Bentmont and not me because he's the guest. And uh, you, uh, you grew up in. Uh, you were born in Gainesville, and in Florida. There's, there's a Georgia and a Texas. There's a bunch of Gainesvilles. Okay, but Gainesville, Florida, the, the the best one. All right, and um, let's see a lot of a lot and and. Like a few of my other friends' guests, um, you were inspired by the Beatles at an early age. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I was living in the Republic of Panama for a while. And my sister said, come here, come here, come here. My, old, my sister's like a year and a half older than I am. She said, you got to hear this. And the radio was playing, I Won't Hold Your Hand nonstop. And I was 10 years old. And I was like, what is this? This is so weird. And I was off to the races. Yeah. That's so cool. I, I was, that, that, it knocked my socks off. We're like in age a year apart. And I remember seeing them on the Ed Sullivan show and, and it kind of blew my mind. And uh, they were just, they weren't like anybody else. Ex exactly. And you know, yeah. the country, the country was, and you know, who said, told me the story, it was, it was a really good story, was Will Lee. Will Lee was a guest here on the show. And, and he said to me, and I never thought of it this way. He said, you know, the country was just reeling from the death of J JFK from, from his assassination. And the country really was in mourning that year. Yeah. And here comes, you know, four months later, the Beatles. And it it shined a whole different light on on everything. And they were so different <clears throat> than everything going on, and uh, you know that kind of opened things up for. Uh, it certainly opened up the musical, the musical doors on what was accepted, and you you didn't Absolutely. yeah you didn't get to have to hear the same, the same style of music all the time. Well, what's interesting is I've heard that theory, but I was ten. <clears throat> I was completely slaughtered by the Beatles. But while I remember when the kid came into the classroom and said, they shot your president, because I was in a school in Panama. 
Um, I remember it really clearly. But by the time they were on the Ed Sullivan show and on American radio, which would have been Armed Forces Radio or something down there, right. and also on the local Panamanian stations, um, I wasn't thinking about Jack Kennedy. Were you thinking about Jack Kennedy? Not at all. No, neither was I. So maybe sociologically and for the climate of the country in general, here's something fresh. But for the people like you and me who are just blown back against the wall by it, for me, it didn't have anything to do with that. It was just so bloody amazingly good. It was just staggeringly good and weird and different and exciting and happy and joyous. And the songs were all wonderful. And there was good, the other myth is that there weren't any good records in the early 60s or after Elvis went into the army. But um, that's not true either. But there wasn't, there wasn't this mass of fantastic music that the Beatles brought and that showed up um, when all the greed said, hey, let's get some more people from England. And you've got the zombies, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, the Who, you know, it's like, that's right. And a whole bunch of other people, Mary Ann Faithful, you know, yeah. um, wow. And on and on and on. So for me, it was, I grew up listening to Rodgers and Hammerstein, Beethoven and Chopin. And I heard Elvis on the radio when I was really tiny and I dug it. I heard Bill Haley and the Comets doing See You Later Alligator, which was a cover. And that really messed my little three or four year old head up. I thought that was incredible. Mm. And I always liked pop, popular music. Sure. I always liked rock and roll. I always liked popular music. And, because I'd grown up listening to Rodgers and Hammerstein and some Irving Berlin and stuff like that as well. I liked the melodic stuff. So sure. the melodic pop music was cool with me at the time, but there, was, there were songs that would just take your breath away or make you wanna just jump around like a lunatic, but there wasn't that, it, it wasn't, drastically different it wasn't brand new it had developed from earlier stuff and the kingpins of the really scary sound which i didn't hear on the radio in gainesville when i was tiny uh little richard right i didn't hear him when i was tiny um jerry lee lewis i didn't hear him much when i was tiny elvis i heard but Buddy Holly, I didn't really hear. I fell in love with Buddy Holly when I was like 22 or 23. Um, later on, later on, we, we... Yeah, later on, because all I heard was Peggy Sue, and I went, well, you know, it's kind yeah, of a yeah. time, which was what he meant to do. And then we went to England, and I got the... And I had fallen for something. Maybe the Busey movie had just like... Song after song after song. I went, I need to rethink this guy. And he has my birthday, too. And so I got two box sets, a German one and a British one, like eight or nine discs each of everything he ever recorded. But at the time, the Beatles also were just, Buddy Holly had a huge impact in England. So they were bringing that back. They were, um, they were singing Motown songs. Mm. You know, they were singing black girl group songs. Sure. Um, they were bringing black music back over here and saying, hey, don't, you know, you need to pay attention. And since they were white, even though they had long hair, they were white and they were British. And so they, they were allowed. But a lot of stations, like white radio stations, I don't think Little Richard's Long Tall Sally got much play on those radio stations. No. Or, or at least at least in the deep know. south. Yeah. But when Paul McCartney showed that he could do it too, and Ringo Starr could swing like a son of a bitch, then it was like, okay. And I didn't know that sound at all. Right. That, I don't remember having heard that sound until I heard McCartney do it. And then I looked, I won a 45, some contest at a shopping mall. I went to the record store, like 11 or 12. And I got Ooh My Soul by Little Richard. I went, oh, that's the guy that, and I put it on and went, holy cow. 
So, you know, they were, they let everybody here reverse engineer it, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. The people who were too young to have found it in the first place or not cosmopolitan enough to my have found first, it. My first venture into a record store was after seeing a, a Broadway play, a musical with my, with my, uh, with my parents eating at a Chinese restaurant and they were like taking too long and right next door was a record store. So I said, can I go in the record store? They said, sure. So I went over there and I heard this interesting record and it was a 45 and I bought it because I had some candy money in my, in my pocket from intermission from the, from the show. Um, and it was Connie Francis, everybody's somebody's fool. And oh, wow. that, that was my first record that I bought. That's great. I thought it was a great record. That. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Look, pop music is fine. The, I, the earliest record I remember buying, my parents had bought the Bill Haley record with See You Later Alligator on it. Right. Um, with kind of a yellow co cover, I think, with a couple dancing as yellow and blue or something. But I remember in Panama, well, even before that, I'd go to record stores and I'd get these 45s that I'd never heard of because they didn't cost anything and they wouldn't blow my allowance. But I bought, in Panama, I bought The Night Has a Thousand Eyes by Bobby V, I think, because I liked the, the chorus and I liked The Night Has a Thousand Eyes. And, I, and it's like, wow, that sounds like science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but... I love, all, like I love all that stuff, but, but the Beatles messed, messed me up. Yeah, they the Beatles did. me up, and then I think that the people that also immediately messed me up, I liked the Dave Clark Five, but the Zombies, and you cover that Zombie song, I played on it. Yeah, you played on that. Um, yeah. I, love, I love that Zombie song, always have, always will. And um, you, uh, let's see, you went to Phillips Exeter Academy. Yeah. My parents thought the high school in uh, Gainesville I would have been eaten alive, I think. <laughs> and so all of us. That was my the, older sister went to high school. That was a hard school was, to get into, my friend. You, you must have been one smart, smart fella. I think that as has often happened, I think, in my life, I wore glasses there. And I was reading because I was curious. I really loved David Lean's movies and I loved Dr. Zhivago, but I couldn't quite get my head around it. And I liked to read. And I had Dr. Zhivago with me and I was reading it. And I was like 12. Mind you, I didn't understand what the hell they were talking about. <laughs> but I think when they said, what you're reading, I said, uh, Boris Pasternak, Dr. Zhivago. And really, and unless my parents paid them some money under the table. I don't know how I got in that school. <laughs> Sometimes they wondered too, but the, the miracle was I came from the deep South because if you don't know North Florida, especially in the 50s and 60s and 40s and 30s and 20s, that's the deep South. That is hellish racism. Not now, I don't believe. And when I was growing up, it was, people were paying more attention, but it was hellish racism. There was Klan in North Florida. In the oh, for sure, for sure. You know, and one of the greatest massacres of, of mass murders of black people in America was a town called, I think, Rosewood, which was a 45 minute drive out of Gainesville. And I think in the twenties, and it was a black community, nice affluent black town. And um, somebody, it wasn't like Emmett Till, but it was some woman accused a black guy of assaulting her. And they burned the whole town down. They burned the whole town down on an accusation that seems to not hold any water. So yeah, it's the deep South. Um, but oddly enough, I'm in the deep South and the black acts aren't on the radio stations that I listen to. Right. I just didn't no, there was anything other than WGGG and W whatever, WAP, WDVH and all that stuff. And so I listened to them and they play Ray Charles. And later on when she showed that they play Aretha Franklin and they play James Brown and they play the Beatles 
and Frank Sinatra and Peter Paul and Mary and Bob Dylan and The Night Has a Thousand Eyes and Witch Doctor, all that kind of crazy stuff. But, but I, didn't out, I didn't find out other than the stuff that was in the top 40, which was really very regional then. There were a lot of black artists with hits, but it was rock and roll rhythm, blues, it was soul music. I went up in, at the end of the summer of love. Um, I went up to my first year in boarding school and the Blues Breakers record with Clapton had come out. The Butterfield Blues Band had shown up. And New England in particular was in New York, New England, the Northeast was an explosion. Total explosion. Yeah. I, went, I went to school in Connecticut. Yeah, Cheshire, it was a total Cheshire blues. Academy. Yeah, it yeah. was a total explosion. Total explosion. So I'm a, a kid from the South and I get to find out about Robert Johnson, B.B. King, everybody. Um, from kids from New York or Boston or Rye or some, or, or my friend uh, Bill McGoon, who's still a friend of mine today. He was from Michigan and he showed up with some Stooges records. Like yeah. the first Stooges album, the first MC5 album. He said, you got to hear this band, the MC5, they're finally putting the record out. Um, so yeah, I got, I went as far north as he could to find out about the stuff that came from as far south as you could go in the United States. But boy, it, that clobbered me because that's where the Beatles and the Rolling Stones came from. And somebody hit me really early, like really early when I was 14, 15 of the latest. You like that Beatles song? Find the Buddy Holly one, find the Little Richard one, find, find the one by the Shirelles. Listen to that and, oh, you like that Clapton and John Mayall thing. Find the original version. Um, you don't like Cream that much, but if you gotta listen to Cream, you like Crossroads. Have you heard this album? And somebody put on King of the Delta Blues Singers who said, go buy this record. And I didn't even know what to think. That's a, that's a, that's certainly nothing I had ever heard before. And there were lots of Delta Blues singers, and he was extraordinary. But there were others that were really, really great. Some... But, but he, that's Robert Johnson. And then it was like, I really liked the Electric Flags version of Killing Floor, and somebody said, "You should hear, <laughs> that's, you should hear, how, you should great, hear Wolf. that's a great version." It's a great version. It's Michael Bloomfield and Nick Bravanides and Buddy Miles and everybody. But then you go and listen to Helen Wolf, and mm -hmm. you're like, and you know, they did a great, great electric flag, did a great version of it. But then you start looking into Wolf and Muddy and all this stuff and, and reading up on, on everything like that. And then Aretha in 67 or 68 put out Never Loved a Me. And I didn't buy the album because you didn't have to. You just heard Aretha on the radio all the time. That, it was just magic. But I still played and I still play like a white Presbyterian kid from, you know, like a college town <laughs> in uh, Florida. I, um, Go figure. Yeah. Wow. Um, but where are you from? Where did you grow up? Well, I grew I, It's interesting. I was born in Manhattan. Mm hmm um, I started my life in Yonkers, New York, and then my parents um, opened a, a company in Puerto Rico. So but I assume that the first record store, the Chinese restaurant wasn't in Puerto Rico, it was it in Yonkers or Manhattan? Yeah, it was in Manhattan, right. But then I, but I, at, at, from like five to nine years old, was in Puerto Rico in San Juan. And all I heard was merengues and chachas and mambos and oh, a, cool. little, a little bit of, of some other kind of Latin stuff because that's all that was played there. There was mm -hmm. nothing else played there. How old were you when you went to Puerto Rico? Uh, I was five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. When were you, when were you born? I was, I was, where was I born? When? Oh, when? 52. 
Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because we both went to uh, Latin cultures right. when we were young. Because when I was 10, I went, and when I was 10 and part of 11, my, I was fav my favorite, band. My, yeah, my favorite live band was a Cuban band. Yeah. Called Los Chevaliers de España. And that's a good name. Yeah. And they were they were from Cuba and they they'd come over and play in Puerto Rico and they were a big band, a Latin big band. And man, they smoked it. Absolutely smoked it. There was uh, music in the air in Panama, but I don't recall it as much as I recall the art. Like the when you would see, you know, Panamanian art, it would be striking. And there was a style of there was a textile style that was really similar to what was like right right in the next country, but it wasn't quite the same, which is kind of interesting because they all flow together. You know, the the lines were imposed on everybody by whoever decided I'm going to rule this up till here. Right. But I didn't hear the Afro-Cuban so much, but I know that it was, I know it was in the air. I know that it was in the air. The other place. I saw more of that when I moved to New Orleans for college. Well, the other place that, that, I, that I lived, and you'll find this interesting, it was Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And I spent a lot of time there. So there was a lot of influenced uh, African, Creole, little bit of Latin, but mostly, you know, rah-rah music is what we used to call it, you know, in, in Haiti. And I spent a lot of time in Haiti. And is Haitian music, is it related to some of the other Caribbean music like Cuban or um or it's kind of a, it's kind of a mishmash, believe it or not, of French 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 African. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. That's White people from every country in the world found a way to oppress. You know? <laughs> Hell yeah. Bloody bloody truth but you know but getting that it kind of it, 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 in your early dna you know just makes so much sense to the what to where i to where i go now it's, it does it, it's kind of self soothes me i must say where where i feel feel really good when i hear things like that because it takes me back to my childhood and um and i dig shit like that i really do oh well, it's uh, wonderful yeah. But um, I got to hit the Haitian dial on my radio app. Um, you know, Latin music plays such an important part in rock and roll because mm -hmm. rock and roll happened when I guess rhythm and blues hit some people in Memphis, some people in um, New Orleans. Right, right, and you can you can name a couple of other towns, but New Orleans and Memphis, um, it really is something. Elvis obviously was from Memphis, but he wasn't the only cat. There was a whole string of cats that lived, recorded, made music, wrote in uh, in Memphis, and Robert Johnson lived in Memphis for a while, so it just goes around. But New Orleans, Little Richard again, Little Richard, Irma Thomas, you know. Uh, um, you know the I, I've been watching I've been watching this the, this documentary called Jazz. Lloyd Price, holy moly! Yeah, Lloyd Lloyd Price. But it's it's all Earl Palmer and a couple other cats, um, Charles Hungry Williams, playing playing the drums, and Chuck Connor played on uh, Keep Knockin'. But the rhythm stuff down there, and that's where jazz comes from, anyhow. Sure. As far as I, um, and then the rhythm stuff, and when you get the Latin comes in, because Professor Longhair is absolutely playing Latin rhythms. The absolutely sometimes it's Guido on the for the and rhythm. and Alan Toussaint, yeah. Oh, Toussaint all the time, all the time. So the way it all just came together. It's a really beautiful thing. It's, it is. It's, it's like nothing. And since I grew up on Rogers and Hammerstein, who were 
great at what they did, really great. Rogers and Hart, who were even deeper, um, and some Irving Berlin, especially when I dove into Fred and Ginger when I was early teens. Sure. And um, the Gershwins and all the those. Gershwin, the Gershwins. Right. Yeah. The deep, deep feel on the radio, the deep mystery feel came from the Flamingos, I Only Have Eyes for You. That had the mystery feel back then. And that record's from 1960 or 61 or 62. So you can't say that it was all dead in the water until the Beatles showed up. Yeah. So I'm, I don't know where, unless it was when Wilson Pickett showed up on the radio, because I was old enough to, to kind of hear it. And also by then you had more black artists on Southern radio. Yeah, but you had, Otis, Pickett, you had Otis Redding, you had Bobby Blue. Otis and, yeah. and Sam and Dave. Sam and Dave. Carla Thomas, the Stax folks, the Muscle Shoals folks, uh, from Fame, and um, you know all that amazing stuff. Spooner rolled them on the Farfisa organ on When a Man Loves a Woman. The, the songwriting, the depth of the groove, and all of that. You came to it because when you were five, you were in Puerto Rico, and then you lived in Haiti, and all of this stuff was just steeped around sure. you. And I don't know what you were hearing in your own house when you were little. So I was but, so I was 13 years old and getting ready to get bar mitzvahed, okay? And my my parents said, what, what do you want as a bar mitzvah present? So I'm watching all these British bands and all this kind of stuff going on and listening to all this, this music. And so I, I said, I want you to take me to a music store. So they took me to Manny's Music in New York City. Oh, wow. And I uh, ended up getting a Farfisa Combo Compact with a Standell amp. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was my, that was my first keyboard. What was your first keyboard? A Farfisa Combo Compact. And I think the amp was a Princeton Reverb. OK. I'm pretty sure the amp was a Princeton Reverb. Later on, I got a Leslie. First, a Leslie. First the first instrument I bought was a guitar, some kind of Epiphone. Right. And um, I wasn't that good at it. It looked great. I got behind the payments on like 11. <laughs> and um, mowing the lawn or whatever I did. And they said, we'll have that back. I don't remember if I kept the Princeton, but I love the Princeton. And then I, uh, I got a Farfisa Combo Compact, which was cool because I could be the bass player too, play the left. Right, right, the right. So we had the first we had so the same here. keyboards. That's great. That's great. Yeah, there was wow. no bass player the first few bands. Wow, I've got a I've got a picture of me at thirteen, playing in a band, with my Farfisa combo compact. Absolutely. So they were great, but the Vox, man, the, the Vox. Vox had a book. But I didn't. Uh, somebody told me probably the people that had the Farfisa dealership rather than the Vox dealership said, "Look, the drawbars are just." too big of a deal to mess with. What you want to do is get the Farfisa because you just hit tabs and you can combine your sounds, which is legit. But then I wind up playing Hammond and I have to figure out the draw bars. And I never did figure out the draw bars on the Vox Continental, <laughs> though I play it a lot. Yeah, I think that I didn't get a Vox. And I was into Vox because I was watching like Dave Clark Five and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. They, they all had Vox. So I think I didn't get a Vox that day because they didn't have one in stock. So I wanted the next best thing. And I got the Farfisa, and I ended up loving the Farfisa. And I got a Farfisa is good. It's a yeah. heavy bag. Yeah, it's I really heavy a... bag. So really tell heavy. me about tell me. I don't want to keep you on this call forever, but tell me about uh, about Mud Crutch and and when you met Tom and put hmm. Mud speaking of Farfisa. Together. Speaking of Farfisas, well, I'd seen Tom around since I was eleven. Got back from Panama. I was hanging around. 11 or 12 hanging around there were two music stores the big one was lipham's and they had all these incredible fender amps custom amps all this stuff the small one was marvin k and they had all the cool vox stuff but i had gotten my guitar from lipham's my father knew the guy that ran it so i hung out at lipham's and i'd play all the pianos and they'd say hey listen try playing this because they'd think maybe his papa will buy this <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
there was a bunch of kids that were a little older who had their hair long for those days because the Beatles and the Rolling Stones had hit. And two of them had blonde hair and a couple of them had dark hair. And one of the blonde haired ones was Tom Petty. And the other blonde haired one was Tom Lennon. And I didn't know them. And I probably said hello, or they said, hey kid, keep it down or something once or twice. But Petty remembered who I was. And when my other friend said, you gotta see this band Mud Crutch, which was Petty, Lennon, Randall Marshall on the drums and Mike Campbell. I was away in boarding school. I got two letters the same day from two different friends saying, you gotta see this band. And when I saw them, I became a fan and just followed them around. And yeah, I'm, a, I'm a huge Mud Crutch fan. Listen to early Mud Crutch with Tom Ledden and Mike Campbell on guitar and no keyboards, just Tom Petty on bass, Randall Marsh, Tom Ledden, Mike Campbell. That was the shit. But finally, the, Petty remembered me from the music store, probably Tom Ledden did too, and went, oh, that kid can play. And they were playing some bar and they said to my friend who was carting your gear, hey, does your friend want to sit in one night? He comes and sees us all the time. Does he want to come sit in? And I said, sure, I'll come down to like the third set or whatever tonight. And I borrowed my mom's car because I was like 17 or 18. And I, I was a fan. I loved to watch them. So what I did was I went out in the garage carrying that damn Farfisa and whatever amp it was, which may have been a twin. And it was so damn heavy that picking it up and putting it in the back of my mom's station wagon, I remember really clearly, I looked down at the handles, those two handles, and I started picking up and went, do I really want to carry this damn thing down there? They're just bored. They don't really want to hear me play. They're just bored out of their minds playing five sets. And in, in the split second that changes your life, I went, what the heck? I'll bring it. And I lifted the damn thing onto the truck with the amp. I went down. I sat in with them for a set. And they said, hey, anytime, anytime. And um, Tom Ledden left the band shortly after. And I sat in with them that night with Ledden and a couple more times with Ledden. But then Ledden left the band. And I wound up when I was home, because I was in college. Whenever I was home, I'd play keyboards with them. And Danny Roberts joined playing lead guitar and sometimes bass, because he and Petty would switch off. Right. And that the first one was very country, very burritos. The second version, when I was in there, played a little Richard songs. So <laughs> oh I had, by then, I had, after the Farfisa, I got rid of the Farfisa and got a Wurlitzer right. and a 100 watt Marshall stack. Oh, that there you go. I think I may have just gotten a half stack. Now, now the you're Wurlitzer, a fireball. The Wurlitzer through the Marshall, because I think now, I, you're a, now, you're, now you're a fucking fireball. <laughs> I had heard Ronnie Wood, I'd heard Ian McCloggan, <laughs> and I'd gone, okay, if I get the Wurlitzer through a Marshall, maybe I can get it to sound like Ronnie Wood, and it's a Wurlitzer, and Ian McClellan plays a Wurlitzer, so I'll have like, I'll be two of the people I dig the most, I'll be trying to emulate both of them. What the hell's wrong? Uh, yeah. I hated, I hated Hammonds. So, um, <laughs> you're, you, you made a solo album with one of my favorite titles of any album I've ever heard of titled, called You Should Be So Lucky. And that yeah. can and that can you know fit on you know a lot of your life, my friend. Oh hell yes! That that should be on your hat band. You know, I should be so lucky. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's true. Although the song was, um, I wanted to write a murder ballad that was a garage rock song, so I wrote one. <laughs> and instead of I took her by her little white hand, he takes her down by the river. And you don't really know what's going to happen, but he's really mad because she said, I don't want to go out with you. What the hell is wrong with you? He's all offended, which is what happens in a murder ballad. The old bluegrass form that goes back, you know, forever and um, forever and ever. So I recorded it that way as a garage rock song. And then shortly after the record came out, well, I know I'm not the guy in the song, but this is really fucked up. 
yeah. because he's an extraordinarily bad guy. He's going to murder this woman. Right. And everybody thought it was kind of camp sometimes, the murder ballads from Appalachia. But they're also sometimes incredibly written and evocative. But so shortly after the record came out, when I performed it, I switched it to being sung by a woman. And the words take on an entirely different meaning. So instead of the guy who's spurned, it's the girl, and you don't change anything but the gender. It's the girl talking to the guy who has like been creeping around stalking or whatever, going, yeah, you should be so lucky. <laughs> and she takes him down by the river and says, you know, like, we'll see how lucky you are as the waters rise. Whoa. And it's a much better song that way. Way and the better. Only thing, the only thing that changes is the gender. So it is a turnaround on, the, it's like, it's a revenge song instead of a murder ballad. And it's a much better song. And I realized that like shortly after the album came out. Wow. And it's, it's, it's much better. So when I play it now, I do that and I say, everybody pretend, pretend I'm a woman. Mm. And it's not easy, but I say, go with, roll with me here. I'm gonna sing it. Women sing Crimson and Clover and all these other songs all the time in a male, from a male perspective or whatever. And, so, and, hey, can I do it? Yeah, you can do it. Uh, well, in this case, and I learned, and I learned you can do it in 1971 when I was at an open mic night at Dr. Generosity's and John Prine got on the stage. Oh, good. And with Steve Goodman, yeah. John Prine walked into place. And yeah. John gets on stage and he sings, uh, Angel from Montgomery. Angel from Montgomery. And the first line tells it all. I am an old, old woman. woman. Yeah. Well, yeah. Prime. Yeah. You know. And then he's, okay. then he, the next song he does is uh, Sam Stone. And then the song after that is Hello in There. And John Prime, you know, he finally got his due. People started paying attention in the last few years of his life. Right. They really did pay attention. Um, and it was well, I, I paid attention from, from Jump Street. Well, I heard St Sam Stone, I'm like, right? But I didn't hear the rest of it because I was listening to the MC5 and the Stooges and John Prime and, uh, and um, Robert Johnson and Wolf and Todd Rundgren's psychedelic stuff and all this. I didn't dive into the Prime wormhole, but my friend Victoria Williams in the early 90s played me Unwed Fathers. And I went, good Lord. And at the same time, my friend Howie Epstein was doing the same thing, going, John Prine. And then he wrangled it so he could produce Prine. And I spent hour after hour in the recording studio with Prine for two records. And there's a song on the record I'm making now that I played on the piano, but it's directly copped from the rhythm that Prine used all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's like I would not have played channel, that if not. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing a song right now called uh, I'm writing right now called Playing Chess with the Master. And that's mm -hmm. totally you know that's it's got John's signature all over it. And you know, and I'm so well, grateful. Yeah, I'm so grateful for for you know having him in my life. Um I want everybody to know that uh this is the guy that is played in the Heartbreakers forever. And uh, day, he played, day one, he's day, played with Bob Dylan, yeah. Stevie Nicks, Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison, the Eurythmics, Fiona Apple, I mean, uh, Ringo. Um, I mean, peace and love, you know? I, I, I well, Damn right. And God damn it, that guy can play his ass off, you know? That, that fucker swings like nobody's business. Unbelievable, unbelievably I mean, the, great, the, great drummer. The, the rap that he was the luckiest guy in England. No, Bullshit. He was the best drummer. Bullshit. He, he is. He, he is. Was the best, he was the best drummer. He yeah. like, you know, the bands that really make it big, or back then really made it big. Elvis Presley had a great drum. Little Richard came out of that, you know, Cosimo Matassa um, sure. recording studio with Earl Palmer and everybody. Um, the Beatles had Ringo, the Rolling Stones had Charlie Watts, Fleetwood Mac has Mick Fleetwood. Right. It goes on and on and on. Um, Led Zeppelin has John Bonham. You go to the drummer, you go to the rhythm section right away. 
If they got songs and rhythm section, you got something. If they have a stiff rhythm section and songs, it'll get somewhere, but it ain't going to change the world. That's right. That's right. Because people don't know they know, but they know. And man, machines and everything are trying, and people with grids are trying to obliterate swinging music, but it never dies. And there's always somebody who shows up who can program their shit to where it swings or whatever you have, here, you know. And the folks, and Fiona won a, a Grammy this year, maybe won two for Fetch the Bolt Cutters. Amy Wood plays drums on that and she swings. And it's also the whole bunch of them in the band. Fiona included, who's, who swings like crazy, banging on a whole bunch of stuff, whatever's around. And so percussion is the swing, it's the everything. That, you got to have a song and you got to swing. I mean, you got a chance. Let's talk about one more thing. Tony Bronigal swings too, you know? Yeah, my, my brother Tony. Yeah, he's, he, he, you know, he's got this thing called the Texas Shuffle that really. Yeah, that's the deal. That yeah. is the, that is the deal. That that is the deal. Um, have it, you thought of a like, title for your new album? Um, I'm not certain yet. Um, it's going to be depends because there's a couple of songs that I want to that I, I was thinking of naming it after. But as the album takes shape, sure, I'm not sure, but I think I know. Okay, I I know. cool. But I'm not sure, so I'm not going to say. All right, no, don't. Uh, Jonathan Wilson is producing it, okay. and he's playing drums on it. He's a great guitar player. He makes beautiful records of his own. He's produced a lot of people. He tours with Roger Waters as the lead guitarist. And he's a gifted, gifted songwriter, singer, and multi-instrumentalist. But when I was going to make this record, I thought, who am I going to get that plays drums that swings? I used Jeremy Stacy last time, but COVID's going on. I can't fly Jeremy in. Right. You know, couldn't fly Glenn Johns in, nothing. So who's going to produce it? Who's going to play drums? And I thought of Wilson. I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really good. Taylor Goldsmith from Dawes is playing guitar. Um, Sebastian Steinberg is playing bass. Wilson playing drums. And there's some other guitar played by Jenny O, who's a singer-songwriter out here who's just really, just really good. And she's not a shredder but she did the thing cool very yeah. very cool i we're all waiting to hear about it um since we're running out of time i'm going to ask you one last question mm -hmm. and that is tell us something that nobody knows about you but then they know it <laughs> we can leave it, we can leave it at that you know i gotta keep something to myself yeah. you know what, no you know, but nobody but um, a few very close friends knows what my daughter's face looks like. Because ah. we, we don't let that out on socials or anything because no. she's on. So you have, a, you have a young, a young daughter now. Congratulations. I have a three, I have a three and a half year old daughter. My yeah. first, my only child. Congratulations. Congratulations. It's murder, but brother, it's the, it's the highest high I ever had. I got high for a long time. Uh, you're, you're a good daddy. You're a good daddy. I'm trying. Her mom's, her mom's a badass. But yeah, I'm so happy to see your face. Your record is really, really good. And I got to turn it up loud earlier. Thank God, you know, because with the child in the house, you can't turn the music up too loud when you're sleeping. Um, it sounds great. And you're singing great. And the songs are beautiful. Thank you, man. You know? Thank you for thank you. And you've got and you've got Stephen Stills. You got Mike Finnegan on the record. You know, Mike Finnegan is as good an organ player as ever lived. Yeah, you know, Mike. Oh, he's great. Well, I've got I've got two of the two of the best playing side by side. It was it was it was a joy playing with you, and I look forward to uh, to doing another one. I've got some interesting songs that I think you're gonna really like that I uh, that I wrote during COVID. One's called. Uh, Dinner for one. All right. Which is oh, yeah, man. which is mm -hmm. Stone Cold out of Cuba. And yeah. another one called uh, The Book of Secrets. Um, Those are both good titles. Which is J JD the ballad of JD Salinger. Oh, cool. I thought you were gonna say Salvin. <laughs> so I think you'll yeah, so I'm I'm holding those, I'm holding those close to the best for you. 
in Idaho. Fantastic. I can't wait to hear him. Yeah. And so uh, God bless you. God bless your child and your and your wife and your family. And I, I can't, bless you. I can't, I love you so much. I can't wait to I hear love your you records. Too. I love you too. Um, I can't wait to, to spend yours again. And um, really, honestly, I can't wait to see you. Okay, man. Okay, man. Peace and love. Peace and love. Bye. All right.